All right, so our, the origins of aneurysmal resection were here in Houston, 1953. And if, it's very interesting if you look at this report, they talk about a 23-year-old married woman as if that made a difference. But that's the way things were back then. And today, the, the care and management of visceral artery aneurysms has changed dramatically from open repair to endovascular repair. And we'll go over all the different aneurysms and treatment options. Keeping in mind that aneurysms of the viscera are quite rare, with the most common being splenic and hepatic, and the smaller vessels providing a greater challenge for repair with higher morbidity and mortality rates, but it is something that you as a vascular surgeon need to understand since you are the surgeon that deals with vessels of all viscera. So um, the, it's important to understand that true aneurysms do differ from pseudoaneurysms in terms of rupture rates, with pseudoaneurysms arising pre predominantly from trauma, infection, and iatrogenic injury. And of course, when they do rupture, um, they provide challenges in terms of repair because of the nature of the etiology, and we'll, I'll show you about that. So rupture rates um, do portend a poor prognosis, particularly in the arteries around the pancreas because you can't just cut through the pancreas to get to the vessels. So those vessels um, around the pancreas and within the stomach tend to have higher mortality rates, whereas the splenic artery, the renal arteries tend to do better in terms of mortality and morbidity rates just because they're easy to get to surgically and endovascularly. So um, splenic artery aneurysms, the highest prevalence, uh, predominantly in women. There is a relationship between the hormone relaxin, which is higher during pregnancy, so these are the aneurysms that you worry about in pregnant women. However, multiple studies have been done, um, and it looking even at uh, UT Southwestern, and women don't tend to present rupture during pregnancy, although there's this you know, voodoo that that is always what occurs. Um, the other etiology is portal hypertension, and that's just because of the back uh, flow and pressure to the splenic artery um, giving rise to aneurysmal dilatation. So in terms of clinical findings, um, most of these are, fine iatrogen are found incidentally because of imaging, uh, especially with the advent of CTEAs. Um, and when they do present, they can present with a double rupture. If you remember, the, um, the uh, lesser sac provides the first wall of protection, and then within that is the, the aneurysm. So there is that sort of double rupture that you think about with these celiac artery aneurysms and other aneurysms around the pancreas. And the mortality rates um, are generally not that high compared to some of the other aneurysms. Um, indications for treatment, obviously anyone who presents with symptoms or rupture needs repair. And then there is sort of that over two centimeters, but really there isn't any data to support fixing an aneurysm over two centimeters. And there is no relationship between calcium. So older Aneurysms don't necessarily mean you can wait longer. So it really sort of is up in the air whether you should fix them or not. And I, I think we tend to watch them a little bit longer than maybe we had 15 years ago. Um, and then obviously complications are related to um, what you do to the pancreas if the aneurysm is within the, um, embedded within the pancreas. So open repair, proximally and mid portion, you can resect it or bypass around it. Distally, you can actually remove the aneurysm um, with the spleen without much advent to the patient. Endovascular repair, um, stenting, coiling, um, and of course that's easier in the main branch of the splenic artery versus the branches outside of the, uh, within the hilum. So this is a nice um, picture. So as you can see, if it's not involved in the pancreas, excision or bypass is suitable. If it does involve the pancreas, oftentimes you need to do a splenectomy or just a pancreatectomy because um, you, you just can't flip the pancreas over and take care of it easily. Um, <clears throat> hepatic artery aneurysms are the second most common visceral artery aneurysm. Most of these are related to trauma, iatrogenic trauma, with, um, it, especially in chemoembolization patients, um, and then those that present with um, vehicular trauma. Risk factors are the usual atherosclerosis, mental degeneration, FMD, and then trauma infection. And then PAN, but PAN we know that we don't treat surgically. 
Most are extra hepatic, so they, they are suitable for repair, and um, repair depends on where they are in relationship to the GDA. Clinical findings most present asymptomatically, but when they do rupture, um, they can obviously present with symptoms with the triad of quinque being abdominal pain, hematopoilia, and obstructive jaundice. In terms of repair, um, obviously anyone with symptoms needs repair, and that applies to all aneurysms, so I don't need to be redundant and tell you about that with each aneurysm we talk about. And then elective repair generally it's over two centimeters, but of course that really depends on the comorbidities of the patients and the size of the patient. Um, and then complications can result in arterial dissection and liver failure. So actual treatment modalities, if you have um, a suitable um, gastroduodenal artery, then resection of a common hepatic artery is a reasonable option. Uh, for the proper hepatic, as you go further out into the liver, you need to reconstruct that, otherwise you'll have ischemia of the liver. And depending on the size of the liver and the function of the liver, you can um, remove or ligate an artery to the right or le uh, left hepatic artery. And endovascular repair, obviously it's easier to treat intrahepatic lesions with coiling and uh, coilamalization. Stents are pretty small and, um, I mean, stenting these arteries would be difficult because of the size. Um, in terms of celiac artery aneurysms, they are rare. Um, th these some aneurysms, however, are associated with pain just because of the nerve structures around that portion of the um, abdominal. And historically, they were associated with syphilis. Um, less commonly, they're related to collagen vascular diseases, dissection, trauma infection, um, and then um, aberrant anatomy. In terms of clinical findings and diagnosis, um, obviously, uh, if they rupture, they're painful, but these also do present with epigastric pain, and like I mentioned earlier, it's because of the, the nerve plexus in that region. And then in cases of rupture, they can present with um, GI hemorrhage, obstructive jaundice, and then that double rupture. In terms of indications for treatment, again, uh, rupture, and then elective repair, greater than one and a half centimeters, two centimeters. Um, operative repair, obviously, um, if you have a, a patent SMA or IMA, ligation of the celiac artery is a reasonable option, as there is good um, collateral flow, as long as your GDA is open to the end organs, including the liver, and then of course with the spleen if you've got your short gastrics open. Endovascular repair, um, of course, is becoming more of the option, treatment option of choice um, with coral embolization. Um, stenting is difficult just because of the flexibility of the celiac artery with respiration. But if you do have an aneurysm that comes off with the neck, then coral em embolization or gluing is a reasonable option. The SMA um, aneurysms predominantly they're in the, the proximal portion of the SMA, but these you know are are rare. But when they do occur, need treatment just because you, you can't re, um, if they rupture, you essentially lose all the small bowel, and that's not compatible with life. Traditionally, these have been mycotic IV drug users, um, secondary to endocarditis. Um, but you can see them with other connective tissue diseases and atherosclerosis, um, and then trauma with uh, pseudoaneurysms. In terms of clinical findings, um, these do present with, with abdominal pain, nausea, um, vomiting, hemorrhage, and then if they are infected, the classic symptoms of fevers, chills, weight loss, that kind of thing. And then um, rupture does portend a poor prognosis just because of the ischemic time to the small bowel. Um, in terms of repair, um, as this is oxymoron. If they're symptomatic or, or ruptured, you should repair them. Essentially, all of them should repair because you need to preserve the blood supply to the small bowel. The definitive treatment um, is removal of the aneurysm. So while antibiotics are necessary in the preoperative um, stage of treatment, um, you do need to ligate them. I mean, you do need to fix them. And oftentimes, if they involve multiple branches, you can't just ligate them. So what you need to do is remove the top of the aneurysm sac and then patch that with a vein graft. Obviously, if they are infected, you can't use prosthetic, and you certainly can't use prosthetic grafts. And you can't jail off branches of the SMA just because that would 
result in ischemia of the small bowel. Um, and then sacular aneurysms, um, if they are true, little sac coming off of it, then you can coil embolize a, coil mm -hmm. them. Um, these aneurysms, the pancreatico duodenal and gastroduodenal, um, are rarer. Oftentimes, they are associated with celiac artery stenosis, um, and that the thought is that there's a higher pressures in these arteries, and that results in um, aneurysmal dilatation of these arteries or pseudoaneurysm development. Um, <clears throat> and like I mentioned, they are rarer. They occur more often in men, um, and, mo and predominantly are pseudoaneurysms. They are pseudoaneurysms, they are related to alcohol use, chronic pancreatitis, and prior operations. And then the true ones are related to compression of the artery. In terms of um, clinical findings and diagnosis, these also present with nonspecific abdominal pain, again, because this is sort of in the root of the abdomen where that nerve plexus is. Um, and then they, of course, can present with rupture. In terms of indications for treatment, there really isn't a good correlation between size and rupture, so the feeling is that all of these have to be repaired. Um, and obviously, the, the general rule is that all pseudoaneurysms should be repaired, um, just as, as would be applied to pseudoaneurysms anywhere in the body, really. Um, and then operative repair, depending on where, um, uh, on where they are in relationship to the pancreas, the GDA is, is easier to reach, but the pancreatic or duodenal is embedded within the pancreas. So oftentimes, um, you know, and getting an angiogram is, is helpful for <coughs> operative planning so that you know the relationship of the artery, what branches are involved, um, how you can preserve them or not preserve them, and the effect on the pancreas. Um, and endovascular options are the best just because uh, you're not, you know, we all remember the rules of don't mess with the pancreas. And that's a nice way of saying it. Um, gastric and gastroepiploic aneurysms, these are sort of out in the, most of these are within the wall of the stomach, so difficult to approach, difficult to make the diagnosis, and oftentimes very vague um, symptoms. These also are degenerative, traumatic, and inflammatory, and commonly in elderly men, um, for some reason, men that drink. Um, and most of them present with rupture. Um, and then in terms of treatment, uh, indications is to treat all of them just because risk of rupture and not having symptoms. Um, and then open repair often requires resection of the stomach wall. And then finally, the, the aneurysms out in the, uh, leading to the branches of the colon, depending on where they are in the colon, you can either repair them or resect them. The prevalence is, is rare. Pathog Pathogenesis is unclear. Um, just very quickly, um, clinical symptoms are vague. Um, indications for treatment less than a centimeter. So it just depends on where they are in in the bowel. And re resection of bowel is, is not morbid to the patient at all. So usually they do require resection of the bowel. And then more proximal lesions can be treated endovascularly as long as they don't have branch points coming off of them that perfuse the bowel. And then I think um, this is pretty straightforward. We know about renal artery aneurysms. They can be bilateral in one third of patients. There's association with FMD, atherosclerosis, and um, conditions as hypertension, renal insufficiency, and primarily because of um, embolization into the parenchyma that would result in pain, hematuria, and then hypertension. Rupture um, rates are low, mortality rates are low just because they are easy to approach and surgically very accessible. Um, treatment modalities, most people would treat them um, endovascularly nowadays. Um, but remember that the, the closer they are in the main branch and anteriorly located are very accessible surgically. If they're out in the distal branches, oftentimes you have to remove the kidney itself. You need to get your transplant surgeon involved. They essentially unroof the top of the aneurysm, patch it, put the kidney back. Um, and these, of course, are difficult to treat endovascular because they're out in the, in the small branch points. And in this, um, you can coral embolization them or glue them without effect to the rest of the parenchyma. Um, and so really, in a nutshell, endovascular treatment is becoming the treatment modality of choice just because it's less morbid to the patient. Um, and the 
technical success is improving as well as the long-term success. That's sort of vagaries, but that's the truth. Um, but the, of course, complications are related to the, the embolization, acute thrombosis, dissection. Um, that's it. Questions?